So it's my huge pleasure to introduce to you Dr Jan Wright, who I'm sure actually needs no introduction to many of the people in this audience. Jan has been the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment for about 10 years now, um, and she's delivered a number of hard-hitting reports, for example in the areas of climate change, 1080, fresh water, and many other topical issues. Her reports are known to be factual, credibly evidence-based, and very hard-hitting. Um, and she's been doing, uh, busy doing what is actually her penultimate uh, report, which is on New Zealand birds. And her talk, which is called Taonga of an Island Nation, draws on this. So, welcome Jan, thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Is the sound working all right? Yep. Good. Um, in my office, we've been working on an investigation into New Zealand's native birds. And I do mean we, because these reports, of course, are not just me. They're also my wonderful staff. I had hoped to release this report before talking to you today, but we haven't quite made it. Um, it's a couple of weeks away. And then that report will be tabled in Parliament by the Speaker and then become public. Just so everyone's clear, this is because I work for Parliament, not for the government, and have the wonderful freedom of being politically independent. But this is the title of the report. I'm using Taonga there as a collective noun because I see our native birds collectively as a great treasure. In the absence of mammals in this country sitting at the top of the ecosystems of these islands. I'm not going to spend the session taking you systematically through the report because I haven't released it yet, that's one reason. But a better title for my presentation than that, I had to give a title earlier, um, today is what fascinated me during the bird investigation. So I'm going to touch on quite a lot of things. And that's because the investigation really has acted as a window into a number of very big questions about conservation. Some of them are philosophical. I'm going to talk today about some thoughts and ideas and framing of issues that go to the heart of why and how we do conservation. The report begins with a vision, restoring abundant, diverse, resilient bird life back onto the mainland. Now, people who know me know that I'm not generally given to visions, but this one has crept up on me and occasionally I am happy to be crazy and ambitious. Of course, it's not going to happen fast. Some have said that predator-free 2050 is meaningless because it's 2050, 33 years away. This doesn't particularly bother me. I'm with Tangata Whenua on timeframes, on 100-year timeframes, on intergenerational timeframes. The word restoring is a deliberate choice because it's future-oriented. For me, conservation is about creating the future, not just about recreating the past. The words abundant and resilient really mean plenty of healthy birds and diverse, not just kiwi. One of the seeds of this investigation was the focus that we currently have on kiwi when we have so many other birds in trouble. I hasten to say that kiwi deserves its iconic status as a polyognath, an old jaw one of the very few birds left in the world that is only a step away from dinosaurs. But why am I thinking about birds back onto the mainland? New Zealand has had great success with island conservation. This is Anchor Island in Dusky Sound, free of introduced mammals for over a decade. I'm one of the people who've been lucky enough to visit it. But is our future only to be island museums that hardly anyone can visit? And some of those islands are running out of carrying capacity, a lack of food or territory, and with small isolated populations, not just of birds, comes the risk of inbreeding. Predator-free 2050 holds the promise of being able to bring back birds to the mainland and keep them safe. And during this investigation, of course, I've been asked why just birds? What about the lizards, the frogs, the insects, not to mention the plants? Um, it's really because birds are at the top of the food webs, they're an indicator of well-being of ecosystems, they're not a perfect indicator. 
And I make no apology for focusing on what appeals to the public in order to get them interested in conservation. So to begin, how are our birds doing? We have for Kiwi a national goal already of turning around a 2% annual decline to a 2% annual increase. But what about all the rest? And one thing that fascinated me was how many species of native birds we have in this country and how diverse they are. We have in our forests 22 perching birds, 9 parrots, 5 kiwi, 2 pigeons, 2 cuckoos and a duck. I feel I ought to be singing, you know, partridge in a pear tree. Um, we have a heap of field, river and coast birds. And there they are, I'm not going to read them all out and a whole lot of seabirds. And that's a lot of birds and a lot of different kinds of birds. The next thing I found fascinating after discovering that was trying to describe how much trouble they are in. And this means dealing with the language of threatened species. At the highest level, birds and other fauna and flora get put into three threat categories, threatened, at risk and not threatened. The first thing that bothered me about this was that the Venn diagram doesn't work. And that's why it doesn't work. You can't, because not threatened is the opposite of threatened. And you can't um, sneak a third category called at risk in between threatened and non-threatened. I'm a mathematician, I can't help thinking like that. And then of course, not only does the mathematics not work, but it's really hard to remember which is worse, threatened or at risk. Is threatened short for being threatened with extinction, or is at risk short for at risk of extinction? What it actually means is at risk of slipping into being threatened with extinction, which is all a bit too hard. So in the report, we renamed them, simply like this, in serious trouble, in some trouble, and doing OK, and why not? I would love to be able to distinguish between those that are just doing OK and those that are thriving, but the threat classification system doesn't allow for this. I find that slightly worrying. The next thing I found fascinating was that the classification of threats to birds is all about the threat to taxa. But there is no distinction made between levels of taxa, whether a taxon is a species, a subspecies, or more mysteriously, an evolutionarily significant population. In this report, we are presenting the threat at that high level and just at species level. So if I cut to the chase, this is the state of our native birds. 168 bird species, in serious trouble, one in three. In some trouble, about a half, doing okay, one in five. That's pretty worrying. But what is a species? And that's the next thing I became fascinated by. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote, I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other. The fact that really it was about dividing up a continuum he saw as part of the evidence for evolution. A century and a half later from Darwin, we still have no universally accepted way of defining a species, and this matters because species are what someone has called the currency of conservation. We must save this species or that species, and we find it very hard to bring ourselves to say we should let this one or that one go. But the ways of defining species, which there are many, are generally based on one of two concepts. The first is old school, the biological concept. Can these two individuals mate and produce viable offspring? If so, they belong to the same species. The second is the phylogenetic concept, based on genetics, obviously. Species grouped in a way that reflects their evolutionary history. Phylo, Greek word for tribe, what tribe they come from. Use of the phylogenetic concept leads to, list, to longer lists of species because you can make finer distinctions at a genetic level. And this matters for conservation, because when you decide that one species that you defined under the biological concept is really two under the phylogenetic concept, there will be fewer individuals in each. And so the more species there are, the more endangered species there are. The species of birds in New Zealand, like elsewhere in the world at the moment, appear to be somewhat fluid. And I don't know how much this is 
due to the use of the phylogenetic concept. But let's look at shags. In 2005, we had nine species of shag. In 2012, we had 12. In 2017, we now have 13. It's moves. This year, the Royal Society Rutherford Lecture was given by Dame Georgina Mace, a world leader in conservation science, and I'm sure many of you here, here heard her speak. I had the privilege of having dinner with her and testing out some of our thinking. In a paper titled The Taxonomy, in the role of taxonomy in species conservation, she writes this, the lists of species that we make for taxonomic purposes should not be the same as the targets we set for conservation planning and action. I'm gonna repeat that because I think that's fundamental. The lists of species we make for taxonomic purposes, describing what is, should not be the same as the targets we set for conservation planning and action, what we should do about it. And this takes me to the next thing I'm fascinated by. How should we value species? Are all species of equal value? I think the answer is no. There are various reasons why people put different values on different species. For me, the starting point is our contribution to global biodiversity. So that means endemism is important. Is this bird endemic? Is it only found in New Zealand? Because these endemic species are surely our greatest contribution to global biodiversity. Of our 168 species of birds, 93 are endemic. That's a high proportion. I think there's only one or two in Britain that are endemic. Um, then there are, but there, another thing about endemism, that there are different levels or depths of it, how far back in time you can, a species goes. When did it begin? And if we look at the depth of endemism, we have the Kiwi at order level. It goes back a really long way. And I think that's why I do value it highly. Um, the, it goes back to what we call order level. Orders branch into families, and another of 11 of our birds go back to family level. That's a long way back. Families branch into genera, and another nine of our birds go back to genus level, and then genera branch into species. Most of our endemic birds are, at, are endemic at the species level. And I would put it to you that we could argue that the deeper the endemism is, the more special the bird is. Those that go back beyond species level are mostly forest birds. There are three that are not. One of the shags, the New Zealand snipe, which has been described as a shorebird gone bush, and the ribill, which is one of my favorites. The only bird in the world that has a beak that curves laterally to the side, always to the right. Great for getting insects at insects uh, under round river stones. The ribill, is one of the birds that's in serious trouble. But another thing we might think about in value, valuing uh, different species is what about genetic distance? How different is species A from species B? I must confess I am far more concerned about the single kokako than I am about the 13th shag, because the 13th shag is close to the other 12, but there is only one species of kokako which sings beautifully, by the way, another of my favorites. As an aside, I wish we called shags cormorants as they do in other countries. It would have saved a lot of rather poor witticisms in my office during this investigation. <laughs> when we think about the value of native species that are not endemic, the ones that have arrived here, we should consider how well they are doing in other countries. I think that's important. If they're doing fine overseas, perhaps we don't have to worry about them so much now. But contribution to global biodiversity is only one measure of value, of course. The Takahe is only shallowly endemic. But the story of its astonishing discovery in 1948 makes it special to us. And the magnificent Kotuku, the great white heron, although it is abundant in Australia and Asia, it is particularly treasured by Maori and incredibly beautiful. I didn't expect <coughs> to get so intrigued by taxonomy. Can, is this my water, is it? It's a little swig. <coughs> but moving on from taxonomy, back to the vision. Restoring abundant, diverse, resilient bird life on the mainland. To achieve this, birds need three things. Safety from predators, and this is the big one, no question about that. Somewhere to live, the right sort of habitat, and resilience 
A basic requirement for resilience is a measure of genetic diversity. A bunch of clones is not resilient. And I'm going to make a few comments about each of these three, and again, I will be focusing on the things that I am intrigued by. <clears throat> so first, beginning with predators. Obviously, there is a major overlap between this investigation and predator-free 2050, but there is a very important difference. Being predator-free is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end, the end of restoring our natural heritage. The end is birds and bats and lizards and frogs and insects and all the flora. Predator-free 2050 on the mainland is about targeting just three predators, possums, rats, and stoats. But if goats are wrecking the habitat, so there's not enough food for the birds, the birds won't be abundant. This is one of my favorite photos that will be in the report. <laughs> Two goats up a tree in the King Country. You might not be able to see the black one that's fast asleep with a belly full of foliage at the back. The birds won't thrive either if we eradicate rats and in their absence, the mice go nuts. There will still be plenty of rodents, plenty of food to fuel the growth of the stoat population. And the birds won't do well if there are lots of feral cats around. I want to diverge for a moment on feral cats. I'm really worried about them. In parts of the country, they are really living it up and multiplying on a diet of fresh rabbit. Within the predator-proof fence at Cape Kidnappers, they have killed more than 1,400 feral cats in the last decade. That's one every two or three days. The Australians are working very hard on dealing with feral cats using the humane poison known as PAP, and among a heap of other things, experimenting with different ways of luring feral cats to the poison, so poison bait with sounds, sounds of birds in distress and cats on heat. But if we go back to predator-free 2050, other people here will speak with far more knowledge than I about the potential for breakthrough genetic technologies to suppress and potentially eradicate predators altogether. Technologies like gene drive that could potentially drive infertility through a predator population. But let me make one point about it. I don't much like the term social license, but the concept matters hugely. We need to be talking about this with the public before it becomes a big issue, a big conflict. Kevin Esfelt, who is a leader in gene drive research, is launching with colleagues what he calls the Responsive Science Project, a central repository of ideas and information relevant to gene drive research that will permit open assessment and critique before experiments begin. Notice that, open assessment and critique before experiments begin. It may be that we can never eradicate any of these predators the name of the game now is suppression, and it may remain that way. But we need to get a whole lot better at doing suppression, suppression in the meantime. If not, we may succeed in building a wonderful high-tech hospital. That is, we may eradicate predators in the future, but by the time we do it and can cure the patient, the patient may be dead. The birds may die before breakthrough technologies deal to the predators. 80% of our native birds are in trouble right now. Great things are happening, new innovative trapping and poisoning technologies. But that, of course, brings me back to 1080, or for this audience, sodium fluoroacetate. Something that's not widely known is that the native mammals of Western Australia, including the possums, are resistant to 1080. That's because they have evolved, along with plants like this, that contain naturally high concentrations of the toxin. Our possums come from Western Australia, so 1080 will kill them. But what fascinated me about 1080, and you know I've done 1080 pretty thoroughly in the past, what fascinated me about it in this investigation is the challenge of making the effectiveness of an aerial drop last longer. Because when a forest masts in the years when trees flower and fruit and seed, and fruit and seed prolifically, and rats and mice reach epidemic proportions, and stoats you eat the rats and the mice and in their turn breed to far greater numbers than in a normal year, then in a mast year like that, 1080 is absolutely essential. It's also essential for landscape control 
scale control, especially when their land is rugged and difficult to access. There's no question in my mind that we will need 1080 for the foreseeable future. Maybe one day we won't. But what we need to work on now is making the suppression caused by the suppression of the predators caused by a 1080 drop last a lot longer. And I would just say, um, I don't think he's here today, but to me, Graham Elliott is a dock treasure because of the hugely important work he and others are doing on optimising the use of 1080. After a drop, the predators do come back, first the rats and the mice. And this bounce back is faster in warmer, more productive forests. Making predator suppression last longer is partly about optimising timing. But it's also likely to be about using some of the new trapping and poisoning technologies as part of an operation, perhaps along valley floors that function as rat highways. And another thing, the buffer zones we leave in drop areas around waterways and tracks and huts contain rats poised to reinvade. And while this is managed more consistently than in the past, we should remember that every such buffer zone reduces the effectiveness of a 1080 drop. And I worry in that regard that we are letting perceived risk sometimes trump real risk. We've had two masts in recent years and two battles for our birds fought by the Department of Conservation, but we hardly blanketed the country with 1080. The green areas are masting forest in 2014, a mast year. The darker the green, the heavier the seeding. The purple areas are where the battle was fought. Only 16% of the area where rat and stoat populations were going nuts. But now, moving now, after safety from predators, the sec next thing birds need is habitat, somewhere to live and nest and thrive. Thankfully for the birds, the days of large scale habitat loss are largely gone. But two aspects of habitat that held special interest for me. First, the restoration of habitat onto land outside the conservation estate. Most of the land managed by DOC is forested and alpine and the habitats of some birds are underrepresented. Many public reserves are small and fragmented and some birds can become trapped within them. Then there are peninsulas bordered by sea, so the rate of reinvasion by predators is lower. It's a good place to reduce predators. And the land on peninsulas is largely in private hands or owned by iwi. So restoration of habitat on land outside the conservation estate is really important. And we used to think that when we put land inside national parks and other reserves, it was automatically protected, protected from some things, but not for the life within, not for the, the predators, the, the animals that destroy habitat, diseases, whatever, still there. What really amazed me in the 1080 investigation that, that was that only on one eighth of the conservation estate was there any predator control at all. I don't know what those numbers are updated. Similarly though, when it's private land, when a QE2 covenant, for example, is put on an area of farmland, a fence is built around it. Here's one covenanted area. It happens to be habitat underrepresented in the conservation estate, which is great. The fence keeps out cattle and sheep, but it won't keep out possums and rats and stoats, and it won't keep out feral cats and ferrets and weasels. Another kind of covenant are the kawanata placed on iwi land under Ngā Whenua Rahui, like this one on a regenerating dune wetland, another kind of land outside the conservation estate. For these kawanata, Funding is used to restore habitat and to control predators, which is great. Not so for the QE2 covenants, because there are so many interested in placing covenants on parts of their land that virtually all the funding is used on establishing new covenants. Incidentally, the QE2 covenants are established in perpetuity, and I really like this aspect of them. The other thing I became intrigued by in the habitat part of the investigation was the practice of eco-sourcing. What is it? When restoring native ecosystems, eco-sourcing requires that seedlings to be planted must be grown from seeds collected from plants within the local area. And here's one use of eco-sourcing. Auckland has been divided into nine bioregions. If you are restoring a patch of bush in Auckland, you must eco-source from the right bioregion. And I'm told that this can be a condition in resource consents. But what about the tree down the road that someone brought from a nursery? It could have come from anywhere. 
Its pollen and its seed won't stay put, but be carried by wind, birds, and insects. I just don't get this. There may be case in some, some cases, things might grow better, but nine bioregions in Auckland. This is not trying to preserve some ancient rainforest in a national park. This is about restoring across the country. But why am I concerned about it anyway? Because, you know, is it really doing any harm? Because if we are to bring our birds back in big numbers to the mainland, we need good habitat for them, and we need it restored in many different places. And rules that are unnecessarily restrictive always have an opportunity cost. That opportunity cost may manifest itself as fewer seedlings being planted. It may mean less money available for spending on controlling predators. And it will almost certainly mean unnecessary hassle, delay, and frustration. So, getting on to the third one. Three things birds need, safety from predators, somewhere to live that provides them with food and places to nest, and for the third, sufficient genetic diversity for long-term resilience. Writing this chapter in the report has been particularly challenging, I would say. But what did I find particularly fascinating about genetic diversity in birds? First, learning about the four forces of evolution, because I'm not a biologist. Fortunately, I have some biologists in my office, some very good ones. But focusing on a third of those forces, genetic drift, it happens all the time, but its effects are magnified in small, isolated populations. And this can lead to the problems that come from inbreeding, like European royalty. Here's an example. The, the Habsburg jaw that began in the Polish royal family um, this is actually a portrait of Charles II of Spain, thread, spread right through all of royal families. He's the king, so this is a flattering portrait, you can be sure of that. Another example of genetic drift in a small isolated population is the haemophilia in the descendants of Queen Victoria. These people did not get these genetic problems through natural selection, they, by adapting to the environments they lived in. The Habsburg jaw and haemophilia were not adaptations to living in palaces. It's because these people could only marry really blue blood. So I worry about small, isolated populations of birds drifting towards homogeneity, drifting towards the shallow end of the gene pool. Some on islands where they have been put for the excellent reason of safety and some in fragments of habitat, because we've broken up habitat with our farms and our towns and our cities. And by doing so, by doing both of those things, we have greatly reduced the fourth force of evolution, migration. That is birds moving naturally from one place to another, and that's what normally counters the genetic drift. And that raises the risk of inbreeding. Here is a kokako on Territory Martinga in the Hauraki Gulf a wattle bird in a wattle tree. There are only 20 or so kokako on this island. One of them, named Bandit, which is irrelevant, um, is now consorting with his grandmother. This might be a happy relationship, but it doesn't feel like a healthy one. <laughs> Translocations, which is doc speak for moving birds, are expensive and should not be done lightly. But we need clear principles and processes, and sorry, clear principles and policies governing translocation for increasing genetic diversity or preserving it. I must confess I am puzzled by restrictions such as not being able to move kiwi from the west coast of Northland to the east coast. Apparently, this is because the kiwi on the west have longer bills than kiwi on the east. You might call me a simple physicist, but isn't this like saying people like me with big noses can't marry people with small noses? I really don't get it. We really have to sort this out, because we now know how much trouble some of our most iconic species are in. We talk of bringing kakapo and black robin back from the brink of extinction. No, we haven't. They hover on the brink of extinction because they are so inbred. And keeping a species on the brink of extinction is a very expensive place to be. The recovery of a species is about more than numbers of birds. The Cape to City project in Hawke's Bay is a great initiative. I'm all for it. But I'm bothered by one of its objectives, which has been labelled strong genetics. It's defined as this. Don't pollute special local genetics. I think this is wrong. We need a little pollution of local genetics. It's not often 
I advocate pollution. Another thing I find fascinating is the involvement of private sector players and philanthropists in conservation. During the investigation, we became aware of some tensions in this space. And it seems to me that one source of this tension is attitude to risk. One thing that often happens in discussions on environmental issues is appeals to what is known as the precautionary principle. And such appeals can close down discussions. This principle is not something set in stone, and it gets interpreted in many different ways. Personally, I think we should be as precautionary as we possibly can be when it comes to reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. But we shouldn't always be precautionary. Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner and author of this wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I recommend to everyone to read, defines the precautionary principle as strong aversion to loss. In general, losses loom large in the public sector. A bad outcome can earn not just a bollocking from the minister, but end up on the front page of the newspaper. But making gains usually involves taking risks, something the private sector is more familiar with. We need both. We need the deep knowledge and experience of the public sector and the entrepreneurship of the private sector. Thank you very much for listening, and do read the Birds Report when it comes out. Download from the website. We can get hard copy for free. That's the ad. Um, but in conclusion, ka ora te nahiri, ka ora na manu Māori, ka ora ai te iwi. Thank you. Plenty of time for questions, so um, please fire away. It's fine if there aren't any. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about um, the the uh, pollution, the, your your pollution question. So, uh, presumably, what you're advocating for is that potentially sub subspecies should be intermingled at some point. Well. I'm not quite sure what a subspecies is. It's even more problematic than a species. Um, but we actually do have uh, some management of birds going on in New Zealand, particularly so with kiwi, I believe, um, where different populations are kept separate. Uh, sometimes it's because genetic distances are found, um, sometimes not. Um, if you do find genetic differences, are they meaningful anyway? Um, but why, why it's a little pollution is that if you are concerned about an isolated population, a particular species of birds that is quite small, say on an island or in some habitat, then a very good reason for translocation is to bring um, one or two birds a year from somewhere else into that population. But of course, what we actually need is to really sort this out, because a lot of debate in this area. And you know, the, the Kiwi Recovery Plan refers to something like sound genetic principles, but it doesn't say what they are. We have, um, within DOC, it has um, big, thick documents, which are procedures, standard operating procedures for moving birds around. But when it comes to why you would do it, um, that's not uh, really elucidated. So um, really what I'm trying to do is to bring this issue out into the open, because we can see, and I know where some species are being treated in this way anyway, to preserve genetic diversity, but we can't manage any more kakapo, you know, with this, this business of letting them all become the same, not through our fault in that case, um, is just uh, not the way, cannot be the way of the future. And so really what I'm advocating is get ahead of the game before you get to that stage. Um, resilience is an interesting word and it means things, different things to different people. I mean, I believe it means something to social scientists, but I'm certainly aware that it means... Sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. Which sorry, word? Uh, it's resilience. Resilience, yes. Um, and it, you, it's well used in ecology um, for a whole range of reasons, but yeah. I'm wondering why you focus on the genetic issues in resilience and not the other aspects. Um, we could have. Um, it just struck me as an issue that needed to be talked about out in the open and really sorted because there are such different views around about it. But this, um, 
I always get asked this about every investigation, why didn't you do such and such? And there have been a few times when I've thought, why on earth are we looking at all the birds? This is far too hard. Uh, so it's really just, you know, you, you draw the line somewhere. But I'm sure that I'm sure other aspects are important. Question down the front here. Um, thank you for a fascinating talk, Jen. Uh, it was mm -hmm. great. Um, in your review, um, science, this is obviously a science conference, so were there any particular areas, especially in those uh, three uh, criteria of uh, predators, of uh, um, habitat and resilience, mm -hmm. was there any obvious gaps or areas of priority that you identified? Mm. Well, the, um, w w we're just finalising the report right now, hopefully this week, um, and the last chapter contains, I think, seven recommendations for things that could be done differently, but they will be unveiled when the report is released. Jan campbell Lecky from the uh, Hawke's Bay Regional Council. I just wanted to briefly correct um, one sort of little misapprehension. So uh, I'm, in I'm in charge of the Cape to City project. So thank you very much for making the comment around that. And it was lovely to have your staff hosted up there and to look at what we're doing. Really appreciated that opportunity. Uh, just to be clear, we're absolutely in favour of a little pollution in genetics. Uh, because ultimately, if we're going to get to where we need to be, that will have to be part of the picture. So from our perspective, that's a very important part of the overall context. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want a misapprehension amongst the conference delegates that we saw it the other way. Yeah. So but really appreciated your talk. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Jan, thanks again also for the talk. Um, you, you, you made a comment about the term social licence to operate yep. and your concern with the term, but your um, support for the discussion underneath that. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Oh, I, I just think, it's, I, <laughs> I, like some people, I like certain words and don't like others. I, I find this the terms, I mean, I don't know what else you would use instead of social licence as a shortcut for what we're talking about. Um, but. Um, you know, you can't go out to the public and say, we're talking to you today about such and such because we need a social licence to operate. So I guess I don't like the use of it. It's okay within, but in terms of communication generally, it's not the sort of thing that gets people interested. So it's not, not, a, not a deep comment. <laughs> One last question from Daniel down the back. Thanks, Jen. Um, great talk. I was just wondering, um, Genetic analysis is incredibly expensive, and from a, a sanctuary management point of view, um, I'm quite interested in your thoughts on what the end game looks like. Are we looking at a, a set of principles or a set of guidelines to guide mixing of populations? Um, yeah. What, what, what sort of principles I'm thinking of? Yeah, so, so I, guess, I, guess what, I guess what I'm interested in is one way to take this is that we do intensive, expensive genetic analysis of the populations that we hold on islands or sanctuaries so that we can maintain this mixing. The alternative is, for example, if you imagine a species like Teaki or Saddleback, mm. um, that species is not governed by a recovery group at this point. So are there... I mean, I guess, I guess I'm wondering, what's your vision? Do we create a set of principles or guidelines to guide how we move these species around? Or do we do this intensive, expensive analysis to help guide the way we manage the populations? Well, there's already, there's already some expensive, intensive genetic analysis going on, which hasn't resulted in anything but divided opinions um, on what it means, or, you know, whether it's meaningful at all and what we should do as a result of it. Um, I guess I'm... I think you may not always, translocations occur all the time because people often like them. You know, it's a big exciting thing for a community group to have new birds brought in. Um, I'm, what I'm saying is I think one of the good reasons for doing it is gen for um, preserving or increasing genetic diversity. I guess what I'm saying is that if you have a small, op pop small isolated population of Saddleback here and another small one there and another small one somewhere else where they're not connected at all, You've cut off the natural migration because they would have been much more prolific around the place. Um, and uh, I think you can assume that it might be a good idea to move one or two birds a year. You don't need to, the, the great thing about this is you don't need to move many birds. But we do seem to have a very um, fundamental disagreement where some people think that 
pres preserving genetic diversity or creating it as sort of mixing birds up to some extent. And other people think that that population is different from that population, different from that population, and we preserve genetic diversity by keeping them separate. And that is, those two are uh, at such odds from each, other, from each other. We really need to sort this out. Well, thank you very much, Jen. I uh, really look forward to seeing what the report holds. And please join me once again in thanking Jan very much for coming in this morning.